This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 44. Coming up on Space Time, the merging neutron stars that may well have given birth to a black hole. NASA's Dawn spacecraft moves into a new orbit around the dwarf planet Ceres. And another successful test for an Australian hybrid rocket engine. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. It now seems last year's historic first ever gravitational wave detection of a collision between two neutron stars most likely did end up creating a black hole. The findings are based on newly analysed data taken by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory in the days, weeks and months after the spectacular neutron star merger back on August 17, 2017. The merger detection, officially catalogued as GW170817, marked the first ever direct gravitational wave observations of a neutron star merger, and the first time that any gravitational wave observation was also detected in the electromagnetic spectrum. Stars are great fiery balls of hydrostatic equilibrium. That means the gravitational pressure crushing everything down towards the centre of the star is balanced by the outward energy pressure of nuclear fusion taking place in the star's core. When stars first ignite, they fuse hydrogen into helium. Later, when the core hydrogen runs out, they begin fusing helium into oxygen and carbon. For stars like the Sun, that's where the cycle ends. But for stars, say, eight times more massive than the Sun, they have enough gravitational energy and pressure to cause oxygen and carbon to fuse into progressively heavier and heavier elements until finally the star tries to fuse iron in its core. Now, no matter how massive the star is, it's not going to be able to undertake core hydrogen fusion into anything heavier. Consequently, that balancing act we talked about between the outward pressure of energy counterbalancing the inward pressure of gravity comes to an end and gravity wins. When this happens, the gravitational pressure becomes so extreme, the star suddenly undergoes a massive collapse, crushing down onto its core, and then exploding as a core collapse supernova. This process is so violent that it crushes together the protons and electrons in the stellar core, forming neutrons, hence the stellar name neutron star. Normally, neutron stars are the smallest and densest stellar objects known supported against further collapse by something called neutron degeneracy pressure, meaning you just can't squeeze neutrons into anything denser. In the case of GW170817, the two neutron stars spiral into each other, resulting in the release of gravitational wave and electromagnetic energy. The two interferometers of the LIGO collaboration, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories, as well as a third detector in Italy called Virgo, picked up the gravitational waves from the merger as the very fabric of space-time stretched one way and then the other ever so slightly as the gravitational waves passed through it. And just 1.7 seconds after the detection of the gravitational wave, the European Space Agency's Integral Telescope and NASA's Fermi Gamma-ray Space Telescope both observed a short gamma-ray burst coming from the same direction as the gravitational waves. For the first time in history, an electromagnetic signature was being observed coming from a gravitational wave event source. In the following hours, some 70 observatories on seven continents and in space, including gamma-ray, x-ray, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared and radio wave telescopes, all slewed towards the event source, a lenticular elliptical galaxy known as NGC 4993, located some 130 million light years away in the southern sky constellation of Hydra. The gravitational wave signal had a duration of about 100 seconds, showing all the characteristics in intensity and frequency expected from the inspiraling of two merging neutron stars. One of these two neutron stars would have been somewhere between 1.36 and 1.6 times the mass of the Sun, while the other was slightly smaller, at about 1.17 to 1.36 solar masses. This merger produced a kilonova, a transient astronomical event emitting a short gamma-ray burst and strong electromagnetic radiation due to the radioactive decay of the heavy rapid neutron capture process, which produces atomic nuclei heavier than iron, things like gold and uranium. But that's not all the merger produced. See, one of the big questions from the beginning was whether or not this merger would have created a bigger neutron star 
or whether it passed beyond the neutron degeneracy stage to spawn a black hole. The LIGO data suggested that the mass of the object resulting from the neutron star merger was about 2.74 times the mass of the Sun. Now, that puts it on a real tightrope of identity, implying it's either a very massive neutron star or possibly one of the lowest confirmed stellar mass black holes. Previous stellar mass black hole record holders were around 4 to 5 solar masses. And that's where the Chandra observations come in, because they're pretty telling not only for what they revealed, but really for what they didn't show. You see, if the neutron stars merged to form what was simply a more massive neutron star, then astronomers would expect it to spin rapidly, generating a very strong magnetic field. And the strong magnetic field would in turn have created an expanding bubble of high-energy particles that would have resulted in bright X-ray emissions. But instead, the Chandra data shows levels of X-rays that are a factor of a few to several hundred times lower than what's expected for a rapidly spinning merged neutron star and an associated bubble of high-energy particles. And all that implies that rather than simply a bigger neutron star, what was formed from this merger was in fact something even more exotic, a stellar mass black hole. If confirmed, the result shows that a recipe for making stellar mass black holes can be somewhat more complicated than thought. In the case of GW170817, it would have required, well, firstly, two stars, each about eight times the mass of the Sun or more, both of which had to end their lives and explode as supernovae, leaving behind two neutron stars in a sufficiently tight orbit for gravitational wave radiation to bring the two neutron stars together, allowing them to merge. Astronomers have long suspected that neutron star mergers would form black holes and produce bursts of radiation. But while the hypotheses always looked good, they've lacked the strong physical evidence for it, at least until now. A Chandra observation two to three days after the event found the detector source, but subsequent observations nine, 15 and 16 days after the event did result in detections. The source went behind the sun soon after, but further brightening was seen in Chandra observations about 110 days after the event, followed by comparable X-ray intensity after about 160 days. By comparing the Chandra X-ray observations with those undertaken by the National Science Foundation's Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico, the study's lead author, David Pooley, from Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, was able to conclude that the X-ray emissions were exclusively caused by a shockwave coming from the neutron star merger and smashing into surrounding gas. In fact, Pooley says there's absolutely no sign of X-rays being generated by a neutron star itself, only from the merger. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, will be tested by future X-ray and radio observations. If the remnant does turn out to be a neutron star with a strong magnetic field, then the source should continue to get brighter in both X-rays and radio wavelengths over the next couple of years, as the bubble of high-energy particles catches up with the decelerating shock front. But on the other hand, if it is a stellar black hole that was formed, then the X-ray emissions will continue to weaken, becoming fainter and fainter in line with the weakening shock wave. Either way, we're in for some really interesting astronomy. If the follow-up observations find that a heavy neutron star was created by the merger, that would challenge current hypotheses about the structure and formation evolution of neutron stars and how massive they can get. Current observations place the upper limit for neutron degeneracy at about 2.18 solar masses. It's the neutron degeneracy equivalent to 1.44 solar masses, the point at which electron degeneracy occurs, also known as the Chandrasekhar limit. So what all this means is that once a neutron star gets more massive than 2.18 solar masses, it should continue collapsing beyond the neutron degeneracy stage into an even denser object such as quark degenerate matter or a stellar mass black hole. One of the researchers involved in the original neutron star observations was Professor Susan Scott with the Australian National University. It was always one of the very big questions that came out of that amazing collision that we observed, first of all, in gravitational waves. So the question that arose was, what was the merged object that resulted? And as you pointed out, the two possibilities were that it was a very heavy neutron star or that at some point the merged object was so heavy that it collapsed 
and formed a black hole. Now, there's been quite a, a lot of investigation of this. Of course, we don't have complete information. But this uh, recent paper using data from the Chandra X-ray Observatory lends weight to the fact that the merged object is currently a black hole. What's interesting about all this is that earlier this year there was a paper out pointing out that another merger probably did create a black hole and they were able to place a size on that of 2.18 solar masses which would mean neutron degeneracy comes in at that level in the same way that electron degeneracy comes in at 1.44 solar masses. If the calculations for this neutron star merger are correct, then the resulting object was 2.74 times the mass of the sun, which would certainly put it in the stellar black hole category. That's correct. And we believe that at some point it did collapse. Now, what this current paper says that it happened well before about the 100-day mark after the collision because they're not seeing enough X-ray emission to come down, you know, from the spin-down uh, emission from a neutron star which occurs in the X-ray band. They're, they're just seeing enough, you know, to come from the uh, jet that's emitted from the collision and therefore it strongly suggests that the black hole formed well before that. Now, interestingly, um, we are also performing searches for gravitational waves from the newly formed object. So that would be, even if it existed for a short time, we're looking for existence of its existence for that short period. And uh, those searches are still going on. So um, we hope to contribute to this debate in the not-too-distant future. What happens when neutron degeneracy is, is surpassed? Do we get quark matter first and, and then a black hole, or is quark matter part of the black hole story, or is there a gap between the two? Well, the quark matter fits in between the two, as you suggested, and it's still an open question as to whether you know quark stars exist, for example. A black hole will form when you have a certain concentration of matter within a certain radius and that is a point of no return. So if these two neutron stars form that kind of density of matter within that radius then it will collapse very quickly. Either way we should be getting some answers in the next year or so I guess. Yes and not the least of which comes from the fact that LIGO is going online again from next February and we hope to be a bit more sensitive so we hope to observe more of these collisions and of course we will be better prepared and our electromagnetic partners will be better prepared and so we'll be able to input much more information into what happens when two neutron stars collide and also we do hope in the future to have a collision between a neutron star and a black hole. That's still the missing piece of the puzzle, isn't it? We've now seen stellar mass black holes collide, we've seen neutron stars collide, but the collision between those two, a neutron star and a stellar mass black hole, to produce a nice kilonova is, uh, is something we're still waiting for. That's right. That's on our wish list for future events, among various other things. But even just much more observation time of colliding neutron stars will tell us so much more physics about, you know, how heavy elements, metals and so on are produced and the actual process of the collision and the process of these hyperstable formed neutron stars and how and when they collapse to form a black hole if they do. I guess the other exciting thing about all this is how well the astronomical community coordinated once the general location of the gravitational wave source was identified. We had all the, something like 70 telescopes all slewing into position to try and catch a glimpse of what's going on. Yes, yeah, so it was It was like a sort of avalanche of telescopes mm. and satellites from around the world adjusting their schedule so that they could get onto this uh, location. And we've never had that happen before on such a, a scale. And it took a lot of preparation to have everybody kind of primed for that. But of course, there was also a little bit of complacency because we'd kept on observing binary black hole systems. So it did sort of come a bit out of the blue and it was right at the end of the second observing period for LIGO. So it was it was a, a great surprise in the final days of that run. And there was a bit of scrambling and we will be better prepared during the third observing run of LIGO to make sure that 
everybody is ready to go when when an alert comes out. And we'll also have Virgo up and running as well. I know Virgo was associated with the neutron star gravitational wave detections, but uh, it'll be nice to have Virgo there for the third run, and hopefully we'll have a situation where India comes online in the next decade as well. That's right. Well, having Virgo online really only happened in the you know final month or so of the second observing run, but it makes a huge difference because we can get a better localization on our event, and that gives our our astronomy partners a much better chance of actually pinpointing the source. So we really need Virgo in there to make that feasible. And as you pointed out, LIGO India is in the process of construction and within the next 10 years, hopefully it will also be online and that will improve the situation again. We'll have better localization again of, of our event. That's Professor Susan Scott from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's Dawn spacecraft is moving into its lowest ever orbit for its closest ever view of the dwarf planet Ceres. The move will bring the probe some 10 times closer to the surface, down to an altitude of just 50 kilometres. It's expected to be Dawn's final orbital change for the mission. Once in position, Dawn will begin collecting images and other science data from this unprecedented vantage point. Dawn will collect gamma ray and neutron spectra, helping scientists understand the variations in the chemical makeup of Ceres surface layers. Dawn's operations team have worked for months, plotting the course for this second extended mission for the spacecraft. In fact, mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, mapped out more than 45,000 possible trajectories before devising a plan that will allow the spacecraft's iron propulsion system to place it in the best position for further scientific observations. Dawn was launched back in September 2007 on a mission to explore the distant worlds of Vesta and Ceres, the two largest bodies in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. The two worlds are on opposite sides of the snow line, the distance from the sun beyond which it's cold enough for volatile compounds such as water, ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide to condense into solid ice grains. The 1,218kg spacecraft achieved orbit insertion around the asteroid Vesta in July 2011. Vesta is the brightest asteroid visible from Earth, and contains some 9% of the total mass of the main asteroid belt. The 525-kilometre-wide world has a differentiated internal structure, with metallic iron-nickel core surrounded by a rocky mantle, composed primarily of olivine. After 14 months of surveys, Dawn left Vesta and travelled to its second target, the dwarf planet Ceres, arriving in March 2015. With a diameter of 945 kilometres, Ceres is almost twice as big as Vesta, making it by far the largest object in the main asteroid belt and containing something like a third of the belt's total mass. Like Vesta, Ceres appears to be a differentiated world. Instead of a metallic core, Ceres' core is rocky. And instead of Vesta's olivine rocky mantle, Ceres' mantle appears to be made up of ices and may also have a remnant internal ocean of liquid water under its icy crust. Ceres' surface appears to be a mixture of water ice frozen hard as rock and various hydrated minerals such as carbonates and clays. I'm Stuart Gary, and you're listening to Space Time. Gold Coast company Gilmore Space Technologies have moved a step closer to their ultimate goal of launching their first rocket into space following the completion of another static test firing of the company's hybrid rocket engine design. The company says the 12-second burn of its first stage orbital rocket engine achieved 75 kilonewtons or 16,900 pounds of thrust during the test firing at its Westmar facility some 400 kilometres west of Brisbane. An earlier test back in March generated some 70 kilonewtons of thrust in what the company described at the time as the world's largest successful test of a single-port hybrid rocket engine. Gilmore plans a suborbital test flight from its Queensland test site later this year, pending Australian Civil Aviation Safety Authority approval. That launch will be the first full-scale test flight of the engine which will ultimately power the first stage of the company's Ares three-stage orbital rocket. Gilmore plans to have Ares launching payloads of up to 400 kilograms into low Earth orbit within two years. 
The flight will also test the company's new mobile launch platform, designed to enable rapid low-cost launches from remote locations and without the heavy infrastructure required for conventional spaceport facilities. The latest engine test fire comes just weeks after the federal government officially launched Australia's first space agency, releasing details of a nine-month space industry review. The report included recommendations supporting next-generation rocket propulsion systems and made necessary changes to the Space Activities Act to enable commercial satellite launches from Australia. The Ares hybrid rocket engine uses a mixture of liquid propellant and 3D-printed solid-fuel grains. Conventional solid-fueled rockets burn a rubberized aluminum mixture, providing huge amounts of thrust compared to conventional liquid-fueled rockets. However, solid-fuel rockets lack controllability, meaning once ignited, they'll continue burning at full throttle until their fuel supply is empty. On the other hand, conventional liquid-fueled rocket motors provide throttle control, allowing the engines to be turned on and off as needed and also adjusted in the amount of power they produce The problem is liquid-fueled rockets don't develop nearly as much power as solids. They also require complex turbine systems to provide sufficient combustion chamber pressure, and they need fairly extensive cryogenic propellant production and storage facilities. The hybrid design allows the development of a rocket engine with both high performance and a degree of throttle control. Meanwhile, across the Tasman in New Zealand, Rocket Lab are continuing preparations for their next Electron rocket launch, now slated for a launch window opening on June the 23rd. The flight was originally slated for April 20, but was scrubbed due to motor controller anomalies. The Electron is powered by the unique electric pump-equipped Rutherford rocket engine. The 17-metre-tall two-stage carbon composite electron uses conventional RP-1 kerosene propellant and a cryogenic liquid oxygen oxidizer. Nine Rutherford engines are fitted to the first or core stage, with one on the upper stage. Each Rutherford first-stage engine produces some 18 kilonewtons or 4,000 pounds of thrust, while the upper stage produces 22 kilonewtons or 4,900 pounds. That's enough to launch small CubeSat-sized payloads of up to 225 kilograms into 500 kilometre high low Earth orbit. The Electron Launch Facility is located on the Mahia Peninsula on the New Zealand North Island's east coast, with Mission Control based several hundred kilometres away in Auckland. The Electron's first launch in May 2017 reached an altitude of 224 kilometres, but failed to achieve orbit because of ground equipment failures. Rocket Lab made up for that in January 2018 when the Electron placed four satellite payloads, including the Humanity Star Reflector, into their planned low Earth orbits. The company already has seven more Electron launches on the books for this year and expects to soon be carrying out a launch roughly every two weeks. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. As the Northern Hemisphere moves from spring into the summer of 2018, those of us south of the equator are shaking off what's officially been the driest autumn in 130 years. And according to the Bureau of Meteorology, Australia's National Weather Service, Antipodeans are now facing warmer, drier than average conditions this winter across large parts of Australia. Weather and rainfall patterns have changed dramatically across Australia over the past few decades. The winter outlook follows one of Australia's warmest autumns on record and its second warmest summer on record, with southern mainland Australia also experiencing one of its driest autumns on record. The outlook suggests that winter rainfall is likely to be below average for New South Wales, South Australia, Northern Victoria and parts of Western Australia. The shift towards dry conditions will be especially strong in areas around the Murray-Darling Basin and in eastern New South Wales, with both areas expecting a 70-80% to chance of below-average rainfall. The Bureau says winter daytime temperatures are also likely to be warmer than average, especially in New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. And the nights too will be warmer than average across most of the country, except that is for the tropical north, where it's warm all the time. And the thing is, Australia's main climate drivers, the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the Indian Ocean Dipole, are both currently in a neutral phase, meaning there's no strong shift in the outlook towards widespread wetter or drier conditions. And that means other climate drivers, such as global warming, will have a greater influence. 
It also means warmer than normal temperatures in the Tasman Sea this winter and lower than normal barometric pressure, resulting in a weakening of the westerly winds over southern Australia that normally draw cold fronts up from the Southern Ocean. What all this means is below average winter rains for western parts of Western Australia and for most of New South Wales, extending both north across the border into southern Queensland and south into northern Victoria. The dry outlook for June also suggests a later than normal start to the snow season. However, a neutral El Nino southern oscillation in Indian Ocean Dipole usually also means deeper than average snow cover by late July. A review of 179 different studies warns that not only isn't there any evidence that popping vitamins or minerals protects against or helps treat heart disease, but researchers have confirmed that some supplements, such as antioxidants and vitamin B3, that's niacin, may actually increase the risk of death. The one exception is folic acid, vitamin B9, which may reduce the risk of stroke. The researchers also say the best way to look after your heart is by getting your vitamins and minerals the natural way, through a healthy diet, which includes lots of fruits and veggies, not too much meat. You can read the findings reported in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. A new fertility study of over 800 Australian and New Zealand women undergoing acupuncture treatment during their in vitro fertilisation cycle has found no significant difference in live birth rates. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, supports recent guidelines from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, countless previous scientific research showing acupuncture's only real benefit is through its placebo effect. Scientists from New Zealand's University of Otago are in Scotland this month undertaking environmental DNA sampling of the waters of Loch Ness to see what might be living there. And while they probably won't find any fabled monsters in the loch's murky waters, there's lots of locals and monster chasers who are hoping otherwise. Environmental DNA involves cataloguing all the tiny DNA remnants found in water samples collected from, in this case, Loch Ness. You see, while life may not be Nessy, it certainly is messy, and whenever a living organism moves through its environment, it leaves behind tiny fragments of its DNA from skin, scales, feathers, fur, or other bodily secretions. So, all the DNA being left behind by life in and around the lock provides a fairly extensive sample of what's living in the area. Think of it as forensic crime scene DNA, but on a bigger scale. Researchers will then make comparisons between Loch Ness and other sites to see how it differs, if indeed it does. Sadly, scientists, being a fairly level-headed bunch, aren't really expecting to find any monster DNA during their search. But they are hoping to gain an extraordinary amount of new knowledge about the organisms that do inhabit Loch Ness, which, after all, is the UK's largest body of fresh water. As for the legend of the famous Loch Ness monster, well, of course, it dates back more than a thousand years. In fact, the earliest reports of a monster in the vicinity of Loch Ness appears in the life of St. Columba, written in the 6th century. Believers in the lake monster speculate that Nessie may be part of a surviving colony of prehistoric marine reptiles, such as plesiosaurs. Of course, Loch Ness is connected to the ocean, so large fish, like sharks, have been proposed as a more likely explanation. Other possible explanations include big eels, catfish, sturgeons, otters, floating logs the wake from passing boats, and just ripples in the water. Then, of course, there are all those man-made Nessie hoaxes as well, meant just to be a bit of fun or to keep the tourists coming. In 1942, science fiction writer Isaac Asimov introduced the world to his three laws of robotics in his short story Runaround. The three laws, quoted as being from the Handbook of Robotics 56th edition in the year 2058, are as follows... A robot may not injure a human or, through inaction, allow a human to come to harm. A robot must obey the orders given to it by a human, except when such orders would conflict with the first law. And a robot must protect its own existence, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. Well, it's not quite the three laws of robotics, but Australia's chief scientist Alan Finkel has unveiled plans for what he describes as new ethical standards for artificial intelligence, which he wants imposed on companies to protect consumers. With the details, we're joined by Alex Ahar of Reut from ITY. Asimov wrote in the 50s about these 
laws of robotics because he was sick and tired of these science fiction robot stories where the robot would come and try and kill everybody. So he said, look, why don't we have these? Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And so he said, why don't we have uh, rules for robots whereby they cannot allow humans to come to harm, whether directly or through inaction? And he had a set of three laws. And of course, many of his stories went about showing how there were flaws in those laws and how robots would take things literally or, or not sort of understand things and humans had to sort of come to the rescue. But those laws were predicated upon robots having these AI-capable positronic brains, as he called them at the time, because there were positrons and electrons. And, you know, these robots already had artificial intelligence. They were quite smart. And uh, today's robots can't ch- challenge a human. Today's AI is still very primitive. I mean, it's only sort of, I guess, yeah, recently that... plug out. <laughs> well, that's right. And the question is, have robots or artificial intelligence actually uh, passed the Turing test of appearing to be human? Now, if you believe the demos from Google's I.O. conference a few weeks ago, where they had their artificial intelligence Oh, that was assistant. real. You could not tell that person wasn't a real person. Well, the thing is, though, people are now questioning whether that was just faked, because um, a lot of oh. tech demos get faked. How come when they the person answered the phone, they didn't say, you know, it's so-and-so's uh, laundry or so-and-so's restaurant or so-and-so's hairdresser? You know, that sort of just smoothly went into the conversation. And it just, some people are saying, look, it seemed fake. I mean, look, eventually AI will be able to do that. Everyone thought it was the person taking the phone call who was the AI, not the person actually making the appointment. That, that's what flabbergasted me. Flabbergasted, I haven't used that word forever. Yeah. Uh, that was that was what really stunned me. That was just wow. Well, it was meant to be the person calling, but there yeah. were some people saying that, look, there's no reason why the person answering couldn't also be a computerized system. If any of that is anywhere near close to being true, well, then, you know, Heck, AI has come a long way. But what Alan Finkel is trying to do is, is create a set of ethical standards, I guess akin a little bit like you were alluding to Asimov's laws of robotics. And this is still just a proposal. I mean, he's talking about uh, the ability to have a uh, certification, like uh, a Turing test that will allow there to be an agreed standard and a clear signal so that individual consumers don't need expert knowledge to make ethical choices. So it's like the Hart Foundation's tick of approval. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, your AI would be able to display this Turing stamp or this Turing certification if they meet the as yet undefined standards and comply with the uh, as yet undefined auditing uh, requirements. That's Alex Zahara of Reut from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 